Hi everyone and welcome to Philanthropy Impact Walking My Shoes series from Professional Advisors, where today we are discussing the changing societal attitude toward tax and wealth. My name is Sophia Sahanek, I'm the Director of Membership and Development here at Philanthropy Impact and also the moderator for this series. This series is carefully curated to bring concise, topical and informative sessions to help you navigate the philanthropy and impact investment space. If you'd like to know more about our services and the benefit of membership for you and for your firm, then get in touch with me today by email. Um, I'll put my email in the chat, sorry. At the end of this recording, it will also be there if you're watching on YouTube. This is a strictly 30 minute session and it will go very quickly, but we do try to encourage audience interaction. So please use the chat to introduce yourselves, have your say and pose questions to our panel. Please make sure to add panel and all attendees or everyone when posting in the chat so that everybody can see it. It's now time to welcome and thank our chair for today, Jamie McLemore, who's partner at Withers Worldwide. So it's Withers now, isn't it? Sorry. And the joining Jamie is Chris Walcroft, partner at Harbottle and Lewis, Catherine Grum, who's a partner and head of family office services at BDO, and Christina Johansson, who's the managing director of Solberger Foundation, a family foundation that supports transformative grassroots movements through climate and justice. Thank you all so much for your insight today. And I will now hand over to Jamie to make a start. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Sophia. Um, I'm very honored to chair this session today. I think we should set the stage by saying that this is not going to be, uh, you know, a, a beating on wealthy people in any way. This is really just a session to explore what we're seeing in the advisory space as changes in attitude toward tax and wealth. And I think with recent events today, the leaking of the Pandora Papers, this type of discussion is as relevant as it's ever been. Um, Chris, I wanted to start with a question to you. You recently wrote an article called A Thoroughly Modern, Modern Judgment, which is very good, and it's available on the Philanthropy Impact website, if anyone wants to read it. I think everyone should. Um, and you actually praised a judgment in which trustees were seeking to make a distribution that would result in a UK tax liability that they could have otherwise avoided. Um, how do you see attitudes toward wealth and in particular tax changing? Well, thanks very much for the plug for the article and um, it's great to be here. Um, you can pay me later, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I will, I will. The, um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the judgment is a really interesting um, example of how things are changing. Um, I mean, to recap it uh, very briefly, it was a case in Jersey where the trustee uh, went along to the court for a blessing of a decision that it was um, planning to make. And that decision basically involved the creation of a tax liability where there didn't need to be one. Um, so the trustee was planning to um, make a distribution to a foundation a charitable foundation and could have a very significant sum of money. I think it was about 75 million pounds and could have done so tax free. Um, but um, influenced by um, some of the family members and in particular um, some of the younger generations, um, a decision was made to structure that in a way that created a tax liability in the UK first um, by um, appointing the funds out to a beneficiary who was resident in the UK, creating the liability, and then that beneficiary um, uh, making donation to the foundation and not claiming full gift aid on it, to, uh, electing not to do that um, in, in order to ensure that there was a liability. And uh, I thought it was a fascinating decision um, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because it just shows um, the uh, well a new a new line of thinking when it comes to tax, and that the courts are willing to embrace that line of thinking, and that it doesn't always have to be about um, paying the least amount of tax possible or minimizing tax to the greatest possible extent. And it was interesting that the decision to do things in that way seems to have been influenced by a family charter that was put together um, which encapsulated uh, the family's values so you know very interesting to see a document of that nature actually bearing fruit 
um, uh, and not, you know, as some people sometimes fear being something that, you know, can be put in a drawer and, and, and not referred back to. Um, the other thing uh, that was interesting, which is a, a legal point, is the expansion of the word um, benefit. Uh, in, this was in, yeah. in, in the specific context of Jersey trust law, but the court was very happy to reach the view that benefit to somebody didn't just have to mean financial benefit and could be much broader than that. And that's a really interesting um, step in the right direction that you know will impact potentially a journey that will impact all sorts of other areas including su sustainable investing and b corps and all these concepts which are going beyond just financials to a broader view of what you know companies or trustees or beneficiaries should be doing so really really interesting judgment and i think it really bears out the sort of direction of travel you know particularly we hear a lot about next generation different values i think this really is the first major judgment from a trust jurisdiction like jersey that i've seen that really starts to see things moving in that direction yeah, that's a that's a really substantive result rather than uh, you know just people talking about it. I mean, the next generation discussion is really interesting, and I wonder if, kind of on top of that, Catherine, if if you could speak to how you see that next generation sort of impacting the work that you do with family offices and even wider, you know, succession planning and, and purpose planning, um, and you know, whether whether tax is still having such a large impact on the way family offices are operating. Yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, I, I followed the case very um, closely, thanks to Chris's article. Um, and I certainly thought that it was um, a really helpful development because it meant that people were actually talking about this more openly because often these conversations happen in private within families and nobody can see the extent to which momentum is being built until something like that comes out into the public domain. And certainly the conversations that I've been having, you can really see, um, a, a while it's not exclusively a, a sort of next and rising generation point, you can see a difference in approach when historically, I think it's fair to say that the more, um, the generations who were controlling the wealth took kind of a barbell approach and they did think about the environment they did think about societal impact and, and issues like that but tended to be in the context of their philanthropy and then yeah. everything else was done separately and what they did to make money was just it was they were wearing two different hats and I think the way in which it's now approached um by the family as a whole but particularly the, the next generation is to say no everything has to align it's all very well us talking about and taking a particular attitude over here but if we're doing something that kind of conflicts with our you know our, our family values or our purpose over here then that actually doesn't sit well with me a, a great example of that recently talking to a family and they were talking about a discussion that they'd had around the impact portfolio that the next generation were leading on and the discussion between two different generations where the senior generation was saying well some of those investments don't sound suitable because you can't hold them in a tax efficient way and the next generation coming back and saying this is the impact portfolio what has tax got to do with it mm. and I just thought that really highlighted the, just the different perspectives and ways of seeing things um, and it's really important when families are doing something like building a family office, which is, um, you know, a structure that is going to potentially be around for multiple generations to make sure that they are actually on the same page and they're aligned in their thinking and their approach. And actually having those discussions at the outset, um, they can be recorded in a family charter, but the value is actually in having those discussions and understanding where the different parties are coming from. Um, tax is a factor in that and tax should be one of the points that's discussed amongst everything else to make mm -hmm. sure that before you kind of build build on top you've got kind of firm foundations but it, would it be fair to say then that we should be seeing a kind of rebalance as between you know what you were saying with the 
kind of traditional investment, traditional philanthropy, you know, these things are, we're going to yeah. see them much more aligned. Yeah, I mean, I'd say. Yeah, another great example, I was speaking to a family, um, sort of next generation family member just last week. And she was telling me that you know, her role within one of the family businesses, um, actually within that business, so it's a, it's a commercial business, but they're looking to how they reinvest some of the profits into mm. causes that the business or at least the historical business of the family have impacted. And I've heard that a couple of times recently. Um, so it's, it's really paying close attention to what the family has done in one particular way and actually looking to see how they can address or involve um, perhaps another part of the family um, enterprise in that redress so it's very much looking sort of across the board um, and you know and another family I was um, doing a family workshop and they had a, a really robust discussion around the tax planning uh, and in this instance um, the father was explaining all the tax he paid over um, you know the, the way in which the company had been set up um, over you know a significant number of years and why he was then taking certain decisions now and I just thought that it was such a healthy discussion to have so that everybody understood because actually in that instance you know there had been a real significant contribution positively that um it was great that the whole family understood and could respect and build in to them when they were thinking about their decisions so they weren't just looking at one one decision one piece of advice now in isolation and christina you come at it actually from the next generation perspective. Um, you're also the founding member of Partners in Progress, which I understand is the uh, UK chapter of the American organization, um, Patriotic Millionaires, which Chris actually referenced in his article that we keep talking about. Well done, Chris, getting lots of references today. Um, I, I wonder if you could just Tell us a bit about Partners in Progress, what it's aiming to achieve in the UK and across Europe, and actually what the response has been to it so far. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks so much for having me here. Um, yeah, I'm Christina and I run my family's philanthropic foundation in the UK, and we focus on funding um, kind of systemic change initiatives. And um, I've come to realize that for us, there's absolutely no way to address um, systemic change and economic inequality without talking about the current broken and unjust tax system that benefits the wealthy whilst putting the burden on the poorest in our society. Um, and we found that too often wealth the wealth advisory industry um, was talking about tax minimization tools and schemes, and it just felt completely at odds with the reality of the crisis we face. And so I was very excited to find uh, the Patriotic Millionaires, an organization of wealth holders who advocate for tax reform and reducing inequality and they are calling for a closure of a number of tax loopholes and workarounds that have allowed wealthy people to pay less while the burden continues to grow in working families in the US. Um, and here in the UK now, we're catching up and uh, we've built a chapter um, called Partners in Progress. And uh, I've been personally seeing attitudes changing amongst peers here and across Europe. For example, there's a really powerful uh, campaign in Germany by, um, called Tax Me Now. Uh, of uh, uh, German millionaires who are um, calling for a higher tax in the wealthy. Um, so I really think there is a significant emerging movement of wealth holders, and in particular next gens, who are no longer looking for ways to reduce their tax bills and who want to pay their fair share of tax. Um, and you can like to build on this movement, the group I mentioned, Partners in Progress, uh, the UK chapter of Patriotic Millionaires, has been launching a series of initiatives. And the first one is recently an open letter to uh, the Chancellor in advance of the October budget. And the aim is to demonstrate from wealth holders that the wealthiest members of society should actually be paying more into the tax system to address the kind of the COVID, NHS, environmental inequality crisis that we face in this country. Um, and we're still collecting signatories. So is there any folks here or clients who want to sign? Um, we're, we're a growing movement. Um, and in addition to Partners in Progress, um, it's been incredible to see initiatives in, in the wealth advisory space uh, such as the Good Ancestor Movement, uh, a consultancy led by the amazing Steph Brabby um, that's power pioneering a new progressive wealth advisory model that's actually supporting folks with wealth minimization, which sounds radical, um, but it's actually like, so it's really needed and uh, developing a positive relationship to taxation because I think more and more of us 
um, as was mentioned in this article, are actually proud to pay taxes. Um, and yeah, I feel like this isn't going away. Uh, this movement of tax reform is growing and um, it has momentum and there's a real opportunity for wealth, the wealth advisory industry to support their clients and being part of in tackling inequality. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, excited if anyone wants to join. Wonderful. No, I think this, I mean, I think that I've, I've, I would ask Chris about his experience with kind of working with next gen. I mean, you, you do reference the fact that in this trust case, it was motivated by, you know, younger members of the family, but is that, you know, is that the only place that we're seeing this push from, or can we also credit, you know, the Warren Buffetts of the world Last who year. have the giving yeah. pledge and, you know, yeah. things like that. This, you know, maybe it's a it's a moment in time rather than necessarily a generational split. Yeah, I, uh, it's a, it's obviously a very uh, complex um, set of circumstances that have um, led to this shift in values, and it's not simply about you know millennials or gen z suddenly all thinking the same way and you know it's it's far more complex than that and in fact you know there are um there, there are plenty of people out there who um you know to some extent correctly get quite frustrated by some of the uh, uh generational um sort of tropes that we have um which aren't always true, often not true. It's definitely the case though, that there are plenty of people in the, you know, older generations who are also, um, you know, shifting their mindset. And, uh, you know, they're, they're particularly on environmental issues, for instance, um, you know, you see lots of clients who are very, very concerned about the legacy that they are leaving for their kids and grandkids and great grandkids, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, and so I mean specifically in relation to tax, it's worth saying that you know in the time I've been practicing, um, which isn't that long despite the greys, um, there's been a huge there's been a huge shift, which I'm not sure um, is is fully understood by the press and the public in, in, um, in the way that kind of tax work is, is carried out and what is and isn't seen as acceptable. When I first started practice, there were still so many kind of schemes around and there were a lot of things that nowadays you would look at and you, you know you would think people were absolutely crazy for even considering so it's very much more now um, about um, ensuring that people are compliant in mm -hmm. a very very complex world particularly when it comes to tax systems um, and most clients, I won't say all clients, but most clients come to it um, with an attitude that they should be paying uh, tax. They should be paying the right amount of tax. There's probably quite a big differential then between clients as to what they consider the right amount to be. But still, that is a That's big shift. Question from you know back in the day when i think the majority of clients came to the table with a, the view of i want to be paying as little as i possibly can and when there was a whole industry of um you have a tax bill we can make it go away type schemes those things are largely a thing of the past and i think that change has actually been quite dramatic it's shifted in the last 10 or 15 years. I think go forward another 10 or 15 years and probably the mentality that we see at the moment will look pretty archaic, but exactly what that looks like, I'm not sure. Yeah, and I, I, I would ask on the back of that, um, I mean, there's one thing to have these sort of tax avoidance schemes, but there still seems to be a place possibly for tax incentives, legitimate tax incentives, you know, things like 
income tax relief for charitable giving. And I, you know, I'll just kind of put out there to everyone. I mean, is do we still feel like there's a place for tax incentives? Does that, you know, have a positive impact probably overall? I have to say, from my perspective, and I should caveat that I don't get involved in detailed tax advice. I'm not a tax advisor, but when I'm talking to the families about the purpose of their wealth um, and the role in which philanthropy or you know, the, the way in which they're they're investing tax is not at the forefront of their minds and I don't think in those kind of big strategic decisions they're going to make big shifts in their approach because they may get certain tax reliefs I think it, it obviously depends on the clients and, and their um, perspectives a lot of the families I'm dealing with see are have significant wealth Mm -hmm. um, and therefore it, it can be uh, without sound I mean sound trite less material for them than I can imagine you know other clients when they're looking at the balance and there are some great initiatives that mean that for a small change more can go to a particular charity or to, to philanthropy more generally um, and I think those are definitely to be welcomed and uh, I know there's work ongoing at the moment looking at exactly where those tax reliefs are spread because you have things like the EIS type tax reliefs and you've got right. um, focus on charitable giving and donations both during lifetime and, and on death but there is kind of a gap around the social impact investing and whether or not you could actually do something effective with tax reliefs in that space to try and encourage people to to look at that um, more and I think there you might start to see have a bit more of a strategic impact in the way in which people approach things um, if you do but I'd say in, in the big picture does someone want to be philanthropic or not then they're not doing that because of tax they're doing that because they're motivated by the causes right because at the end of the day you still have to give money away so <laughs> hmm. the, the, the big problem though Jamie and you will know this more than anyone because of the area of practice you're in in the country um, of practice that you're in is that some tax systems and the UK and the US definitely both fall into this are just way 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 too complicated now mm. and layer upon layer upon layer of complexity and it's hard to see how you roll that back to create a far simpler tax system but I think a lot of clients are probably quite open-minded to the idea of a simpler and fairer tax system. When you get into the detail of it, that's when it gets difficult. Yeah, absolutely. I did want to, I mean, on the, on, you know, talking about the tax system, I won't ask Christina to solve our complicated tax system for us, but I did want to, knowing that, you know, income inequality is, is an area that you're concerned with, how would you see the tax system you know, try to address that anyway. Yeah, I mean, um, I think philanthropy, philanthropy plays a, a, a good role in addressing, um, reduce, like ad reducing harm and, and causes some good things to happen. Obviously, I, I work in philanthropy. I, I think there's amazing things that happen in there. But um, talking about like actually reforming the tax system feels like central to talking about economic inequality and making mm -hmm. reforming it to make it simpler, to make it more just, I mean, um, economic inequality right now in this last year, we saw a fourth of UK households go into now on universal credit while billionaires increased their wealth during the pandemic by 22%. Um, so obviously something's wrong and we need to be having a discussion of how do we dis redistribute like resources in a way that works better in a more just way. And I think more and more wealth holders uh, see that. They see the philanthropy as, as an add-on and absolutely something they're passionate about, but that they're we need to tax wealth and capital better. And um, of course, given the latest, highlighted by the latest revelations last night with the Pandora Papers, we also need to actively be addressing um, and closing the tax loopholes. And we need to be investing properly in HMRC so that people can pay their fair share and that there's, um, there are like specific, there, there are groups and, and we can, I mean, I'm not a tax expert, but there are uh, calls for ways that we can reform this tax system by, um, you know, increase that it makes it a more, more fair and more just tax system. And the way that we've currently done it by recent decisions is to uh, 
uh, to cover these huge financial financial costs we have for the financial needs of the, of the crisis that we live in is to put mm. more uh, to, put, to, to put a tax on working people, the essential workers who carried our back during the pandemic, um, and they're carrying now the heaviest financial bur burden with the national insurance raise. And um, this just isn't the way. So I think wealth holders uh, are coming, like more and more of us are coming together, insure saying that we want the government to not only see that you can look towards us to pay more, but that we're, we'd be proud to pay more. And it needs to be part of the conversation when, it's, when tackling economic inequality. Um, we have a question actually from the chat that maybe we can address in the last few minutes here. Um, it's from, uh, I think it's from James from Beacon Collaborative. Uh, there have been some recent examples of family foundations seeking to spend down their capital over a number of years in order to achieve greater impact. Does this speak to the ways that young people are approaching philanthropy differently? Um, open to the panel. Is this a trend that anyone else is seeing? Um, I mean, that, as a start, I think there is more of a desire amongst kind of younger philanthropists or wealth holders, as, as Christina's saying, which I think is a great term, um, to use everything that is available to them. Again, it's that point about being holistic and not siloed. And so when they are looking at working and supporting a particular cause, a particular uh, charity, and it's not just about how much money they can give, but whether they can use their, their time, whether they can use their contacts, whether they can advocate for that charity or for that cause. And so I think it's a, it's a bit more of a strategic approach in a way. Um, so that is one big difference. I think they are, it's right that whether it's talking about the family wealth or the foundation, I think there's much more of a willingness to think about spending down and you don't start you know even when you're talking mm. about the the planning side you don't start now with a presumption that wealth has to be preserved and held on to it's an mm. open question of what's the plan um, and again you know on the charity side as well the attitude that i'd like my charity to to cease to exist in 5 10 15 years because we've solved the problem that we're tackling i think is one that particularly appeals uh, to the next generation of donors because it then you don't feel like that you know a, a criticism that is sometimes um, laid on charities and not always fairly but that they're, they're there to support and to, you know the money is going to pay the administrative costs and the people working the charity actually if you stand there and say look we're trying to put ourselves out of business by solving this I think that goes to address that as well yeah and perhaps the unfair criticism of the next gen being impatient is a virtue in this regard if they're mm -hmm. going to go out and solve the problem with the money we won't have it anymore yeah i i I'd, I'd echo um the point really good point that catherine um made about wealth preservation i think in the same way that it is no longer an automatic starting point that someone wants to minimize their tax liability it also was and is increasingly no longer an automatic starting point that wealth preservation is always desirable. And I think particularly as um, people have uh, become more conscious of this idea of there being a purpose to wealth and it not just being sort of wealth ownership for ownership's sake, um, people that's then taken uh uh the sort of um it, it's it's taken the attitudes away from just automatic wealth preservation to well what do we want to do and do we necessarily want to keep the wealth for generations and generations and the answer may well be no the wealth needs to have a purpose in which case spending through the capital in a shorter period of time is perhaps desirable in some cases and, and, and possibly more as time goes by. Wonderful. I think we are, we've now reached our time limit. I see Sophia has joined us. <laughs> um, and so we'll, we'll wrap up with, you know, last thoughts from yeah. 
everyone. Thank you. We do have, we have had a couple of questions in the in the chat that we haven't been able to get to, and I can only apologise for that. But this is a strictly <clears throat> strictly thirty minute session, so we're not going to be able to answer those. But feel free to send them through to me, and I'll try and get them answered. Um, my email will be available on the website. Um, but for now, thank you all so much for that. That was brilliant. I think it's such a big topic, but I think we gave it quite a good going over this morning. Obviously, sorry, this afternoon. Um, and I'd like to thank you, Jamie, for doing such a great job. But now it's time for your, your 30 seconds of wisdom, John calls it. But today it's just your final words, whatever you would like to be a takeaway from this conversation, because we're already running over. So mm -hmm. I will start with Chris. Well, I think just that for advisors, I think the key thing is to be uh, more open minded. It's not necessarily the role of a legal advisor or a tax advisor um, to, to preach to the wealth owners about, you know, how the wealth should be used. Um, that has ultimately to come from the wealth owners. But for advisors, there are certain automatic starting points that we sh that shouldn't be automatic um, starting points and should be interrogated um, before advice is given. Thanks, Chris. And Catherine. <laughs> Chris took the words right out of my mouth, I was going to say. Always happens. Literally exactly the same. I think ask questions, uh, and again, I'm speaking to the advisors predominantly, ask questions and listen and, you know, probe on these points about wealth preservation, about, you know, attitudes to tax and create a forum in which you're listening to and you, you create an opportunity to be heard for all the different generations, not just the principles and the, the sort of current wealth holders because they'll thank you for it in the long term if they've actually got the next generation's attitudes and views on board when you're creating and developing a strategy uh, that way they're not fighting about it and trying to dismantle it because it doesn't fit their um, views and values in the future. Christina over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just say that I think there is a movement um, to address inequality through a fair tax system that's growing. And there's a powerful role for wealth holders to play in pushing for um, tax reform. And if you or you have any clients who seem interested in that, connect them with partners in progress and um, have them sign this letter and see how we can leverage our collective voice to, to change things. And final word to you, Jamie. Thank you very much. That's the chair. Well, I, you know, my personal motto is change is a good thing. So I think hearing about, you know, people who are out there trying to make changes and hearing about progress that's being made is very exciting. And I, I look forward to hearing more. I have to apologise for overrunning. It's one time John's not here and I haven't kept the time anywhere near as well as he does. You Sorry. can blame me, Sophia. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so next Monday we will be looking. We're following on from this actually, looking at the um, how we can pro how professional advisors can meet the needs of the next generation of clients, which I think is a nice follow-on session. So uh, hopefully see you next Monday and have a wonderful week, everybody. Thanks. Take care.